Hey yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where the book of the law and the lesser key of Solomon sit proudly on our coffee table. I am Ryan Peverly, your party host, the entity conjuring up this orgiastic feast for that feel spot you got tucked into that inner ear. And if you pay close attention, you'll feel it softly vibrating at 528 hertz. Ooh wee, yes sir, that feels good. Welcome to the show. We've got a guest in the house who writes under the name Blood Ritual Monarch. I'll be chatting with him about a couple of books he's written based on his experience with the occult and perhaps some experience he's had with government-funded mind control programs. Before we get to that, though, I've got a special guest joining me right now. His name is Andrew Austin. Andrew runs an Etsy shop called Ye Old Magic Shop, and he recently sent me a piece of art that he sells through there. He made an acrylic etching of the show's logo, the sigil, which I posted on our social media. I was so grateful that Andrew did this for me because he lives across the pond in the UK and mailed it to me for free. And once I checked out his shop, I thought, hey, let's get this dude on here for a couple of minutes to tell us more about himself and what he does. So Andrew, thanks for being here, man. I got to know how much experience you have with the occult, first of all, because your Etsy shop is an occult fan's wet dream. How much experience do you have with the occult? lengthy i think would be would be fair to say i mean predominantly my my main background is both kabbalah and also crowley's Thelema type work um of which i've really been practicing since i was about 17 18 first i mean i first joined a lodge and started doing it properly when i was i think 18 or 19 so i've got a long long standing i'm a psychotherapist by trade and so i've always had an interest in the mind and and exploring the, the realms of experience and so magic and occultism just takes me into all sorts of areas. Basically, it's the areas that psychotherapy can't touch um, or psychology can't touch. Right. So tell us a little bit about the Etsy store, your art, and how you came to be doing all that. It was mostly by accident. I wanted to make a, an Enochian sigil die a meth, which is like the grand sigil from the Enochian system. I had no idea how to do it, never done it before. And um, so I'd got some beeswax cast it and scratch the uh, the lettering into it and i still got it now it's terrible it really is it's a, it looks terrible but i kind of liked it I, I liked what i did and i was at by coincidence then a few weeks later at an oto meeting they said right we're going to show you how to make these wax discs i was like cool and i i took mine along with me to show everybody like show and tell and essentially i then learned how to do it properly i was like wow okay now i've got something I then discovered, actually, I quite like doing it. Um, I made a, a, a handful of them. People said, oh, can I have one of those? And I thought, yeah. So I sent some out. People were very grateful. I thought, make some more. Let's stick one on Etsy. Seems like a good place to sell it. And it sold. So I thought, okay, I'll make some more of those. And literally all I was doing at the beginning was making wax discs of one type. Then people started asking for, can you do this one? Can you do it like this? Can you make this variation? Well, yeah, of course. The next thing I know, I've got a shop. Um, and then from there, of course, I started looking at what else can I sell? What else can I make? What else can what else can I do? And I think the thing I discovered was that my entire life I'd ignored being creative. I'd always thought creative was something other people did. I was a guy who learned and studied and practiced stuff, but I never created anything myself. Um, and I discovered that actually I've got that ability, as I think everybody has. And so that's, that was how it came about. Um, it was accident, really. That's, I think, the best way to stumble across anything is complete accident. At least that's the things that I've found in my life that when I come across them by accident, they're the ones that are more satisfying, more fulfilling, more exciting you know, spontaneous is not planned out. So yeah. you have had this store for how long and where can people find it then? It's been on, it's been up for a couple of years now. So it's quite well established. It's only really this, the last 12 months that I've really got the stock. Um, I now have a, I think I've got currently 250 different items listed. Um, I've got another 100 or more items yet to list. And so I've got new stock coming in. So I'm both buying in stock but also constantly creating and making new. The best place to find me is on Etsy, and the, the store name is Ye Old Magic Shop. But I put it in the old spelling just to make it impossible for people to find. So it's Ye <laughs> yeah. Old, O-L-D-E, 
magic with a K and then an E on the end. Shop with two P's and an E. Really easy Wait, to find. You said magic with a K and an E? Yeah. Is that an accurate old spelling? No. It just it's just <laughs> it looks nice in in, in an old worldy type font. Yeah. I have to remember, when I when I started this, I had no intention of actually going commercial. It was just uh, I was making some things, thought people like them. I thought, well, let's see if I can sell them. I, I never intended it to become a thing. Um, and now it's become a thing. I'm having to now look at the business end of it, which is the shop name. No one can spell it because I've just made up the spelling. I've actually someone's contacted me to say, you do know there is a, a store in the states that uses that same name. It's like, oh, great. So I've got to work on the business end of it. The creative side's been easy. Now I've got to look at the other end. But it's ye old magic shop. Um, or if people just look for the Enochian discs, I come up pretty much on the top of listings for those things. Yeah, well, I will link directly to your shop here in the show notes. People can see the disc that you sent me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. I've posted that in conjunction with this episode. And can I, can I just add in, if people do have a particular design of Sigil that they want making, um, I, can, I, can pretty much, I can pretty much turn out anything in perspex or in acrylic. It's, it's actually quite easy medium to, to work with. But also in various metals. The, the easiest is copper. Brass is possible, but it starts getting quite complicated. It takes a lot more time to do. Um, and, of course, I can also, get, also get do wax. Um, if people send me their design of what it is they want and an approximate size that they would like it to be, I'll see what I can do, and I, I can, I mean, do a good price for people. So if people want something made, just send me a message. I can tell you I want a gold-plated something or other, so that's that's probably, <laughs> it might be a little out of the price range, but that would be so cool, yeah. I did look at the gold options, but they are, it's so expensive to actually make one of these things. I did, I did consider it. I thought it would be an interesting marketing piece. Uh, spend a, a thousand pounds on the gold and actually make one of these things, but it's risky. Yeah, it definitely is. But at the very least, if nobody buys it, you at least have a gold-plated sigil for yourself. So There is that. There is always that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, hey, man, I appreciate you taking the time here. Like you said, people can find you. Ye old Magic Shop on Etsy. It's linked in the show notes. If you want to give Andrew's storefront a look-see, please do. But without further ado, let's get to the conversation with Blood Ritual Monarch. For the purposes of our chat, he had me call him Greg, and I should say... If you haven't heard my conversation with Chris Garitano in episode 34, that's a great companion piece to this, but it's not necessary at all. Now, Greg is speaking to us from his own personal experience of occult study and practice, which led him to some really fucking weird experiences with demon evocation and sexual possession, and there's also an aspect of mind control in here that we flesh out quite a bit. Probably one of the darker episodes I've done. Actually, there's no probably about it. It is for sure. And per usual, let's open our minds and approach this with a heroic dose of discernment and let's cast this pod off onto the other side of the veil where Bayal, Paimon, and Baleth and their 69 friends are anxiously awaiting our arrival. Enjoy! Greg, thanks for being here. Hey, it's, it's my pleasure. Um, I, I think we connected through, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just about, I'd say, halfway, three quarters of the way through my current book. And uh, I was just kind of ratcheting up, you know, uh, marketing for the Zeppelin curse. I think we connected through that that Twitter account. Yeah, yeah, we did. And I have to thank a friend and a listener of the show. He actually turned me on to your Twitter account. He said, you got to check this guy out. So I don't know if that was fate or not. But here we are talking about, well, <laughs> Some really interesting and thought-provoking ideas, <laughs> actually. But before we get into the core of that, my first question to you, Greg, is are you a victim of U.S. government-funded mind control programming? Well, I mean, I, I can't say for sure. Ryan, I can say I've got, I've got symptoms. There are little little clues here and there, tiny bits of memories. But for me, there's nothing definitive. And I think there are a lot of folks that you know will, will definitively claim they are victims, they know for sure, and, and they have this kind of, you know, um, I know, you know, and, and, and this is this is the reality kind of attitude. And I try very hard not to speak and, uh, you know, make declarative statements like this is how it is. I, I mean, for me, I don't know for sure. Uh, there are certainly clues and evidence, symptoms that point in that direction. But then again, the fact that the subject matter is is now, you know, kind of part of our fringe culture, so to speak, uh, is it out there on purpose? I, I really don't know. Um, so I guess, yeah, to answer your question, I'm not sure. 
Well, that's a fair answer, man. And you actually, you know, the point that you just touched on, you do make that same point in the introduction to your book, Blood Ritual Monarch, about how anyone who's speaking in absolutes about things like mind control or conspiracy theories, you know, should be regarded as suspect. You say you're not telling the reader how things are, you're just sharing your own personal experiences. So I like that you started that particular book like that, you know, with that disclaimer because it does speak directly to the problem that most people have with this sort of subject matter is that there really is no conclusive proof of anything in this field is there uh i would say definitely not i mean always use your intuition use your gut somebody used an analogy i was reading up on uh loch ness actually in relation to researching my current book and they they use the analogy of, of using a sieve i mean there's all sorts of hoax uh you know people just seeking attention absolute you know nonsense out there and then when you shake the sieve all the nonsense falls through and then maybe there are bits and pieces or kernels of of things that you really can explore um but but even then it's all a matter of intuition a, a great website you know, lots of bells and whistles, uh, you know, a leather bond encyclopedia, you know, the stuff that's contained in both just because it's there because someone had the, the, the money or the know how to make it look really presentable. Does that make it true? So I think the only truth comes from your inter- intuition, your, your gut feeling and from what's inside of you. Everyone has a different reality they live in. And I think it's just how it's presented and it might hit one person in one way and they go, yeah, you know, that, that sounds about right for me, but it might not sound right for someone else. So it's you, you can't take things that occur, let's say, on the fourth dimension, uh, fourth dimensional phenomena, and then prove them through third dimensional construct. And then if you can't, you know, then people say, oh, it's not true. Well, you know, I mean, in the end, this this is entertainment. It's stuff that we're fascinated by. It doesn't have to be this, this you know, scientific, either it's true or it's not. That That's that, that's not, not what I like to present here. It's I definitely don't know. Um, and then we go from there. Yeah, that's a good point about the fourth dimensional phenomenon, too, because I actually just stumbled across a, a quote from Carl Sagan recently about, um, he said something to the effect of a fourth dimensional object is not going to leave a fourth dimensional impression in a three dimensional world. It's going to leave a 3D. I think he was talking in relation to crop circles, of all things. So, yeah, it's it's a fair point there, too. You know, I mentioned uh, Blood Ritual Monarch, one of your books. The other book you have is called Sexual Possession. Before we get into that, why did you write these two books to begin with? Uh, I was it was a kind of a form of catharsis. Um, I came to New Zealand, you know, and I thought, okay, I'll, I'll you know, I get away from the the states and all that stuff that was happening. I was kind of spiraling out of control. And uh, my my wife suggested, hey, why don't you write this stuff down? Why don't you start a blog, you know, a, as a way of kind of releasing the, the the pressure because you have to function, you know, in the everyday life. You have to go to work. Um, you can't talk about this stuff. Uh, but it was still something that I, that I needed to express. So, so I started writing a blog, you know, releasing blog excerpts or what have you. And then over time, it, I, I saw I had enough material for a book uh, and then started to piece the blog entries together. Uh, so it's really just, just a way of connecting with people, uh, releasing stuff. And it's definitely helped me, you know, function and be happier in day to day life. Well, let's go back to the genesis then. Where did this story start for you? started I uh, was in my early 20s uh, very much into bodybuilding very isolative uh, behavior and then I was thinking about I was a I was an overnight security officer I was early 20s uh, on the night shift and I was just you know reading various books and then something popped into my head that said you know you, you might die young you know for some reason and I thought okay if I die young I really need to understand what's beyond life you know to be prepared for it and uh, just went off to the bookstore after a night shift uh, borders bookstore in Boston, and I found this book on spiritualism. Uh, it was Hans Holzer, I think, was the author, and I had never been exposed to the subject matter and immediately became obsessed with it. Just something that activated a you know memory in me. It was resonated you know with that subject matter, and it, it just became a blur from there. I went from Hans Holzer to, to demonology very quickly, and then uh, that then Aleister Crowley, and, and then it all just started from there. When did you start your actual occult practice then? Uh, it was very quickly. <laughs> I um I, I started reading about Crowley. Um, I started playing with a Ouija board. Uh, my night shift, I was bored, <laughs> bored with just sitting there and, and was reading my cult books. And then I thought, okay, let me contact the uh, the spirit world through this thing. At that time, I had no proof for me that that any of that stuff existed. So I was very much fascinated by it. So I started using the Ouija board, didn't get any results as far as I could perceive. I think there were results. I just wasn't able to sense them just yet. I think people around me started reacting. And quite often, uh, astral beings can try to communicate with you through 
the people around you, if they have the affinity to do that, if they have the, the genetic makeup to actually interface. And at that time, I was just too clogged up to even know what was in front of me uh, or to pick up on the cues. And then I ordered the Goetia grimoire or spell book, whatever you want to call it. And I don't know if it was in Goetia or not. And I don't look at that book anymore. I don't want to mess with that stuff. But uh, there were instructions to build an evocation mirror. Uh, I really was obsessed with that. I went about all the you know the steps, and I, I built this evocation mirror. And I had the conjuring book, and um, you know I, I started doing the spells and not really paying much attention to the magic circle or any sort of you know uh, precaution. And I think by that time uh, I was already being influenced by those energies. And of course, the, the lack of precaution was was due to that influence because those beings wanted to get inside me and wanted to use me as a portal. So I think a lot of those magic books uh, are actually written by by the demonic energies themselves, and the, the magician or person that's supposedly writing them is actually channeling it. And they're completely unaware of the fact that uh, these instructions are actually tweaked just enough so that the beings can get through. It's, it's just my opinion. So at what point then during the occult practice did you start to become maybe more aware that, that you weren't in control here? I definitely noticed personality uh, shifts. And, and sometimes you can't re- you're too close to yourself. You can't really tell how you're behaving, but you can pick up on the cues from people around you. So I just be- just became more negative, more quick to get angry. The thoughts in my head were really dark, really negative. Uh, my eyes would flare, and I would just, just say really negative, sarcastic things and always had a, a bleak outlook. And then I, I sensed something was going on, but then... Uh, slowly but surely, things started to happen. My, my bed started to shake when, when I would lie in the bed, um, and I noticed wisps of smoke in the conjuring mirror. And that was after weeks and weeks of obsessively, you know, I said, okay, if this isn't working, <laughs> so but let me just keep trying it obsessively. And then slowly but surely, I started feeling things crawling on me. And uh, there was also a sexual aspect to it as well, uh, which I didn't understand at the time. Uh, and I was kind of miserable, miserable, bored, lonely, angry 20-year-old. And I thought, okay, I've, I'm in contact with something here. Let, let, let's, these are kind of like my friends. You know, let, let, let's see what else we can, uh, we can do in regards to the communication. You know, I know some people that have tried to contact spirits, not necessarily demons, I guess, but just spirits in general, and they're unsuccessful. So why do you think you were so successful so soon with that? It's a tough one. I think that the people that are unsuccessful, you have to define success in that regard. And if you did maybe an analysis of what they did, how they did it, and also the people around them, sometimes analyzing those symptoms, those realms are quite subtle. Movies condition us to think that you're going to have head spinning and pea soup coming out and, you know, pictures flying off the wall. Uh, Under certain conditions, I'm sure that stuff can happen. But usually... You know, when entities come through, it's very subtle. And unless someone lives with you and they know your personality, they're they're not going to be able to perceive it. So it's it's a much more subtle process than than what we expect it to be. So those that think they're not successful, they're not getting like the Hellraiser effect. So they think, oh, nothing happened. But in reality, there's something working on on a mental level, spiritual level with them that's so insidious because it's almost like a tapeworm. Once it gets in there, it, it figures out how you think. And it's never going to impulse you with thoughts or ideas that are too far into you because then the light will go off and you'll say, whoa, this is not me. What's going on here? And then you might take action to try and get rid of these things. And they don't want to be sent away. They want to stay forever. I mean, as far as success, I was very intense about it. Uh, I just kind of randomly said, okay, the book says conjure with great emotion. So I thought, ah, okay, I'll, I'll use my favorite rock song from the band Tesla and I'll have my headphones on and I'll listen because I know the song makes me so full of rage and, and fire. And I said, I'll tap into that emotion while I'm doing the ritual. You know, I just tried all kinds of crazy stuff to try and amplify it. And I did it obsessively and things finally happened. So it was it's tough to say. It could be that, that I had a, um, you know, past future. I don't really believe in past or future, but some other life stream that maybe understood how to use this stuff and unconsciously just had the ability to, to do it. I'm not sure. Yeah, you actually made a point uh, in your book that if you have a past life connection to any type of magic, that the spirits will see this and respond to your focus on their realm and that they will view you as a portal to the physical plane. And you also said they may harass you to facilitate their entry into this third dimension. Is that kind of what you're getting at here? 
Yes, Ryan, most definitely. Uh, it, it's kind of an, I call it an astral tagging. It's like you have a tag in your energy field. Once you just start thinking about ghosts, and that's why with, with Ghost Hunters, I don't think, I wrote the second book uh, as a kind of a precautionary tale uh, for people that, that use ghost hunting or it, it's quite popular now uh, as entertainment or thrill seeking. Uh, that once you start vibrating, thinking in that direction, even reading, you know, a ghost book, watching one of those movies, those, those beings, you know, as they're passing through your realm, they'll they'll see your energy field flicker in a different way because you're you're tuning in to them. You believe, and that belief will allow them entry because the belief creates. You know that that's our minds create our realities. So just to get someone to believe or vibrate in that in that direction already starts to pry the door open, uh, and that's when they start working on you mentally. You also said that entities have a limited ability to influence the third dimension. But when you open a portal, they can freely enter our realm and have much more impact and control. So obviously, you know, doing something like a Ouija board is what we're talking about here, right? Correct. Any sort of structured ritual. I mean, a Ouija board, you think, oh, it's just kind of parlor trick entertainment. But that's it's still structured. Uh, You're still doing something uh, in, in a concrete manner you know whether it's uh, you know a summoning ritual you know w- with king solomon goetia type stuff or you know with the ouija board you, you're 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 basically saying i want this to happen uh, even if they're unconscious the, the people that are doing it thinking it's just you know for fun or ah this this couldn't really really happen but there are some people that just start thinking about it and it comes through it's really hard to say but some some do have more of an affinity for this stuff call it an ability or what have you and then things happen uh, much more quickly with, with less effort. But if you put enough effort into it, you will eventually get results. There's a really good movie called uh, The Possession of Michael... Oh, what is it? Michael King, I think? It's this, this guy whose wife dies early, and he, he wants to wants to prove the existence of you know demonic energies, and he's, he will do anything he can to, to disprove it. So he does... All sorts of, you know, goes to psychics, does these rituals, and he even goes to these magicians and says, I'll, I'll, I'll kids playing, uh, I'll pay you, uh, you know, to um, bring a demon forth. And these, these magicians say, okay, he pays them. And they use this ritual and all sorts of, uh, they use, actually ask for a semen uh, and a cup. He's like, ah, oh, whatever, I'll give it a try. Uh, and they actually use that to open the, the portal. And then this guy gets possessed. And he goes back to them later, and he's like, please help me. And they're like, see you later, dude. You know, you you asked for this. So when people push, 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 they're eventually going to push their way through. Yeah, and I'd like to talk a little bit about how these actual demonic energies work, how they actually infiltrate, I guess you might call it your your auric field, and and how they attach to you, and then how how they influence your thoughts and behaviors. Could you maybe tell us just a bit about that? Sure. I mean, once again, this is... You know, from my own experience, and a lot of it is intuitive because uh, there's no way to, you know, no way to prove it. Everyone's going to have a different experience of this stuff. But once they realize that you you, you believe in that stuff, uh, they attach to you. And then it's almost, the, the, I use an analogy of like a glove. You've got a hand and a glove. Your, your body is the glove and the hand is actually the, the entity. Uh, and they'll try to get into your body uh, to experience, you know, the third dimension through your through your body. Food, sex, uh, all sorts of experiences that maybe they, they, they can't engage in from their frequency level. Because I think the non-physical is just like a, it's like a radio dial. It's just a different station. And they're, they're tuning into the, the third dimensional station. But for them to impulse certain behaviors to, to gain more access, whether it's promiscuous sex, it could be alcohol or drug abuse, anything that's going to open you up so that you you will then allow them to anchor themselves further. And, and once they get in, you know, it's hard to say they, they, they go dormant, you know, they play hide and seek. You don't even know if they're in there. Uh, and then they work in ways that are not like like movies. Those cases are quite the anomaly, I think. You mentioned doing things like drinking alcohol or, or, or drugs. I guess certain types of sex can, or I guess all types of sex can open you up. I've been reading a lot recently, for some reason, about the dangers of psychedelics in this area. About how, yes, that they are, they are great tools to sort of access that divinity within you, but that they also, at the same time, may have an adverse effect by opening you up so much that... Some of those energies that you encounter, some of those entities that you encounter, you know, for example, like on DMT or something, could attach to you and you could bring those back with you. Or I'm not really sure if I'm describing that accurately, but kind of see the same thing too with like astral projection, which I think is similar to what we're talking about in terms of out of body experience where you're kind of attached still, you know, to your cord, so to speak. But you're leaving your body and you're leaving that doorway open, right, for anything to come into it. 
You're very, very right. I mean, it's like um, an analogy would be swimming in the ocean. You, you can swim into the ocean uh, and, and, you know, swim with the dolphins. Uh, you seek out that kind of energy, that playful, loving energy, but you, you're, you're still in the ocean. And doesn't mean sharks can't come and check you out and c- come get involved. I mean, the filming a uh, movie like Jaws, you've got a mechanical shark in the water. Uh, the subject matter of the shark, you know, you're in the ocean. It doesn't mean, and other real sharks did come and investigate. Um, and I'm using that as a as a kind of a 3D analogy because that's it's probably the best way for for the mind to understand that is that uh, you, you can't really pick and choose. You you can have the intention to have positive energy, like when you when you trip out on something, but at the same time, you really don't know what's in your unconscious, uh, your past and future lifetimes. You, you don't know what's in there, and it's just like the tip of an iceberg, and you don't know what's under the water you know within your own self so it, almost like with a horror film as well i mean when they made the exorcist they had to do blessings on the set because you're basically representing that subject matter in, in a theatrical format uh for entertainment and it, it, that means you're vibrating to those realms for real and, and they start investigating checking you out and saying hey what, what, what are you doing you're, you're trying to you're trying to de- depict our realm or what what would really happen on film and then all of a sudden it starts to become real. So, yeah, when, when you trip out on things like, you know, DMT or, you know, people recommend you want to clear your space. You want to be in a positive space. You can have a positive experience. It, it's definitely true. You can do your best, but you really don't know what you're unlocking because we, we don't really know what's inside of us. So it's just it's kind of a crapshoot, really. Yeah, and you had some pretty intense experiences while you were trying to, to conjure demons here and... One of them, and I'm I'm not really sure, I don't remember exactly if it was during a conjuring experience or if you just had it. I, th- I think it was a spontaneous kundalini experience. Could you maybe tell the listeners about that? Well, it's funny that the bed started moving, but I, I had to be in the bed and, and I had roommates at the time and they were like, ah, oh, he's conjuring demons. He's a freak. You know, what are you doing in your room there? You know, uh, they just thought it was ridiculous. It was one one of them actually was freaked out by it, but he, he says he was not, uh, not a believer. And qu- quite often the people that aren't say they're not believers, they, they don't their reaction is, is just the opposite. And the other guy just thought it was a joke. And I said, look, come lie in the bed next to me. Uh, and then the bed started to move and phew, he ran out of that room so fast. And then everything changed after that with, with my roommates. As far as the bed moving, I had to be on the bed. And then what I realized is that my my spine would, uh, base of my spine would get warm. So that was my Kundalini energy, I think, activating and I, I really causing the bed to move. That was, that was uh, what I thought of it. And then I started practicing meditating in the morning i'd sit in my lazy boy chair in my room and do some deep breathing exercises and then the the energy i didn't know what it was at the time i mean uh, i didn't understand kundalini hadn't read about it but i just remember this amazing energy shooting up my spine and then once it did uh, it was also a very sexual feeling without thinking about sex so it felt sexual but it wasn't like i was you know in that space mentally uh but as the energy rose up it felt amazing and then my eyes were closed, but the at my third eye, whatever you want to call it, was open, and I, I saw various things. One time, a wasp, human-sized wasp, landed on my lap, very real. Uh, another time, three robed figures. There was no communication there. Uh, and then also, I had seen another experience while I was at the security desk was seeing uh, the Sphinx and seeing actually seeing the heat as if I was in Egypt and in, in the desert, and that just blew me away. I mean, uh, it was amazing. But what was it? I was I was projected into the astral. I think the energies around me activated that that energy to, to pull me into their realm even more. So I so I think it was it was triggered by the, those entities. So what other sorts of conjuring experiments, occult experiments, magical experiments did you undertake during this period of your life that that stand out? I think as far as focused ritual, it was only a few months. During that period, and then once I moved out of that apartment, um, I, I would uh, lie in my bed and I would I would meditate and I, I would try and get the Kundalini to come up again because it felt so good and I, I was you know I had these mystical experiences I wanted to to um, replicate them and have them again and then what I would do is I would kind of start thinking about sex and then I would get in that state and then I would stop thinking about it but I put my body in that place where I was open and then I I, I tried to. I, get the kundalini to rise again and just it just didn't work it was quite frustrating so i guess you could call those those rituals uh, under themselves but after the initial you know using the goetia for those few months and then all this mess started once i had being starting things were touching me in bed they were crawling up the covers i could see the covers move the indentations I could see things out of the corner of my eye rippling by 
and it was just no, it wasn't fun anymore. You know, I felt yucky and, um, but once you open that door, it's, it's, you can't just close it on a dime. It took a while to clean that stuff out. Would the best orgasm you've ever had compare at all to the Kundalini? Not even close. Not because it's like your whole body gets filled with this hot water bottle feeling. It's amazing. And, and afterwards it left this residue of, I don't have any fear at all. I'm, it's like everything is going to be okay. It felt it this wonderful feeling. It lasted for days, you know, that everything's going to be okay. And actually, another experience that it just reminded me was being like shot through the galaxy. I could see stars going by. That was another one of the astral experiences. And that was during the hot water bottle feeling. It just felt great. And I was like, wow, I want to feel this way all the time. And then I started obsessively meditating, trying to, to get that to come back. I wanted to live like like that. You know, and that's what the, maybe the ancient yogis, they... They do that, and they just live in this like exalted state, and they interface with other realities. I mean, I think the source of depression or people being unhappy in the physical is that uh, the original human being, the original genetics that the human had way before this this time cycle, they could all naturally interface with other realities. It was a common thing. You know, you could just just tune into, let's say, this tree spirits or entities or who knows what, and these different intelligences, and you could talk to them. And I think that's part of a whole life. Like, and, and I mean, by me, by that I mean your life being whole and happy. And now I think our genetics are corrupted, and but there's a, a remnant of that memory somewhere in our subconscious that we could live this way on a regular basis, but we can't, and that creates a lot of frustration, depression, and then it leads to all sorts of behavior, drugs, alcohol, anything to get close to that because uh, the human isn't operating at its optimal level. I know I kind of went on a tangent there, but... That's perfectly fine, man. And speaking of genetics, you mentioned that, you know, this kundalini experience may have activated some of those ancient connection to past lives. And I think you specifically mentioned that it activated an ancient Egyptian DNA connection through the Italian side of your genetics. I don't know what you mean by that, but I'd love for you to explain that. Ah, yes. Um... Well, some of the stuff, I mean, I, once uh, I went through several years of, of just blackouts and absolute, you just, you know, I'd, I'd still function and go to work every day, but I just, I would blackout on the weekends and all sorts of symptoms, you know, crying, growling. It was just a mixture of all kinds of trauma coming up and, and the demonic stuff swirling around me. Uh, so I reached out to this, this guy, I was trawling conspiracy websites and, uh, he wrote this book on, on mind control and, um, you know, he had this, you know, consultation you could do on his website. And I thought, ah, I've, I've got a lot of these symptoms on his book. Uh, maybe I can fix this. I can't just go through the rest of my life being like thrown about by these these energies and just being driven mad because they weren't going away. So I sent in, you know, kind of my life history uh, in, in a consultation, you know, and then he came back to me, you know, about a month later with this uh, analysis that, you know, you've got symptoms of mind control and, you know, possession and, and also how mind control can you know, can also interface with possession. Initially, you might think a cult, government mind control, totally separate, but 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 there's definitely a place where they overlap. Uh, in his analysis, you know, I mentioned the experiences I had, and he, I said about the, told him what my, you know, my ancestry was, and it was, you know, Italian, French, uh, and then he, based on his analysis, he thought, okay, the, this Kundalini stuff's happening, you're seeing the Sphinx, you know, it sounds like you're, that's rep- a representation of genetic codes opening or recessive genes being activated through your through your ancestry and and that's why that the the sphinx had had shown up in that that hologram or that um that experience so uh, you know it it sounded like it it made sense intuitively but that that was from his analysis well you also speculated that you have dna from is it lyrian times am i saying that right lyrian times so you know like the atlantis the lost continent of Mm -hmm. mu all that stuff, uh, you know, when there were cataclysms and, you know, like, for instance, the the, the British Isles, um, you know, supposedly that that's part of Atlantis, that that didn't sink. Then you've got actually Montauk Point. If you, uh, Long Island in New York is actually, you know, just about separate from the rest of the continent. Supposedly Long Island is also part of ancient Atlantis. So another thing that this guy, Yuri, in, in my book, he had, you know, said, look, he asked me all sorts of things, you're sexual preferences, you know, because you have to f- ask somebody what they're into and what, what, what they're drawn to. And then if you can find out what someone's drawn to or what their proclivities are, then you can kind of backtrack and think, okay, this is what's prompting 
this particular. Everyone has preferences, and you want to get to the root of those preferences. And and red hair uh, had always been a fascination for me, kind of an, an obsession. And you know, from his analysis, he said, well, you're, you're drawn to that because you know, in those times, the, the people with red hair were much more prevalent. Like in the British Isles, Scotland in particular, lo- lots of redheaded genetics, and those people are supposedly the mystics, the psychics, the witches, you know, and, and they people often with red hair get get razzed about it and saying, oh, you're. But that's, I think those people have the the genetics to interface with the uh, non-physical realms. Probably much more so than than folks that don't, and that that's a generalization for sure. But that's that's where that preference for you know red hair and then the Lilyrian times is it's basically a remnant of the of genetics that could be in me from that time period. I have reddish brownish hair, man, and it, red hair runs rampant in my family. But I'm losing my hair, so I think I'm losing that spiritual <laughs> connection. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> No, I've got I've got the same thing. My my beard gets uh, reddish. My grandfather was a redhead, and it, once I arrived in New Zealand, my hair, my hair turned kind of almost red, and uh, people thought I was dying it. You know, it's just I think it's the sun here. But um, yeah, initially when I was reading up on this guy Yuri's stuff, for some reason I thought you couldn't be mind controlled unless you had you know red hair and blue eyes or green eyes or blonde hair. Uh, so that, ah, I've got brown hair, brown eyes, so not possible. But I think something in me tried to keep me from realizing that even if you have the recessive genes in your background, that you know that, that you could could very well have that 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 mind control stream running through you. And and supposedly, and this is from from Yuri's research, and I'm not sure if that's you know accurate or not. But people that have have that that combination of of red hair. Green eyes, blonde hair, blue eyes are, are more able to absorb mind control. So they have a have a an enzyme in them that allows the mind control to anchor more easily into their uh, into their their psyches. But who knows? It's, it's someone else's theory, and you know, there's no way we can prove any of this stuff. Well, I was curious. Just a, a few minutes ago, you mentioned Atlantis and Mu. These are supposed lost continents, and it makes sense that Montauk would be part of that because why would they be using that location? You know, like there's always been this you know speculation about these these ancient lost continents that there is just some sort of special energy about them. So it makes sense to me, anyways, that you would want to do these sorts of experiments in those sorts of places. But I do want to call out a mention in the book that you said about Mu. You said that Moo can unlock genetic memories. And I guess, first of all, where is Moo supposed to have been? And then, to your point, what do you mean by unlocking genetic memories? That was me referencing coming to New Zealand and wondering if somehow I was drawn here and, and hopefully being in this physical location might be able to help me remember things because I'm still after that. I'm still trying to remember the source of all these symptoms. Uh, and, and maybe it's a protective measure on my psyche. You know, my psyche saying, or my higher self saying, look, if you remember this stuff, you're, you're gonna, you're gonna fry your circuits. Uh, some, sometimes, I mean, that, that's why the brain represses memories and compartmentalizes, and that, that's a survival mechanism. So sometimes we're not meant to remember, even though part of us wants to. But that was a reference to me, uh, you know, supposedly parts of Australia and New Zealand are part of the ancient continent of Mu that, that supposedly sank in a cataclysm. You know, you've got all sorts of weird and dangerous animals and things you find in Australia which is very close by, that you just don't find anywhere else in the world. And that can be indicative of it being a, you know, a continent that just um, didn't sink or bits and pieces of it that didn't sink. And they have the, the, those uh, creatures or you know, animals, lots of poisonous animals there that, that you don't find everywhere else. But Atlantis, Mu, hard to say. You know, some people say well, you know, it, it was one time cycle and, and these continents sank and then another time cycle. Uh, supposedly the Atlanteans played around with crystals and uh, did lots of genetic experiments and they just got the technology actually took them over, and, and that, that's why they, they destroyed their you know, civilization. And, and maybe it's a cyclical thing. It, you know, each civilization destroys itself. You've got ancient Indian texts you know, depicting nuclear wars. And, and the Earth always replenishes itself and comes back. You know, I, I think humans think that they're, they think a, a bit too highly of themselves and their ability to destroy the, the planet. The planet's quite hardy. And, and uh, not that it's a good thing to do that stuff, but it's, you know, if it happens, uh, you know, the planet will still be here. 
<laughs> yeah, I would agree with you about humans being a, a little too, uh, I don't want to say, uh, I don't know how to, I'm just going to say yes, I agree with you. It does seem too that we, we are sort of, you know, heading towards that technological cataclysm here. We, with so much technology, just I think that will definitely lead to the end of this, to what we would call civilization. But I wanted to tie up the, the conversation about your DNA, because you do have a couple interesting mentions in here too, beyond what we've already talked about, about how you may have family ancestry connected to the Committee of 300. That's an interesting interesting anecdote and you also mentioned the Magdalene bloodline the Black Madonna these are more religious connotations here but could you maybe touch on those two points and, and explain to the listener where these connections may come from absolutely first of all I know that any mention of that kind of stuff it immediately it sounds <laughs> it sounds arrogant and it sounds you know like so, someone even making those types of claims it, it can sound ridiculous because that that's where huge egos come in and this this came from my my conversations with Yuri he and I had quite a connection uh back in 2010 he was interacting with me a lot um I think he sensed we, we had some sort of a connection he wasn't asking for any money or any services this guy paid a lot of attention to me I'm not quite sure if there was an agenda there but um you know, he, he shared with me that um, based on my symptoms and genes and, and the stuff I was drawn to, uh, that I could possibly be related to that bloodline. And those are the, the, the red-headed sorcerer kings. And supposedly, Christ and Mary Magdalene had children, and Mary Magdalene left Israel and went up to southern France, and then she had her children there. And then all of a sudden, that, that bloodline just spreads and, um, you know, showed up in, in the um, the royal French families. And, and that's where you get all these, these stories of the, the kings and, and they're doing magic rituals. It's like a they can't help themselves. It's in their genes, and, and they always want to interface, you know, with other realities. So that once again, that stuff came from, from Yuri. And I, I question it. I mean, whether it's true or not, who knows? But once again, the, I, I talk to other people, you know, random stuff pops into my head and it just seems that the stuff I talk about or I'm drawn to, not many other people are into it at all. And that's, you, you can only base your, yourself or your reality on what's around you and comparing it. And I just, it seems that uh, my, my real personality, the one I don't always display at work, of course, is is quite bizarre to most people. So, you know, uh, it's that's why it's nice to have conversations like this. You're into this stuff as well, and and people kind of congregate, you know, when they're like minded that they're into certain subject matter, and I think that's indicative of you know a soul group or, or a vibration that's in resonance. You know, you're you want to hang out with people that have common interests to you. And I know I went off on another tangent <laughs> in no, regard to the genes. No, no. Well, you I know. I want you. The more tangent you go on, the better. I don't, the less I have to talk, to be honest. So <laughs> nobody wants to hear my voice. You know, we started the conversation, my first question to you was about mind control, and we've touched on it here and there throughout this conversation so far, but let's go back to an experience that you had in your youth. You were part of a, like a youth cadet program, and there was some experiences you had while you were part of this program on the East Coast that I'd like you to share because I, I think it might contextualize you know, some of this a little better for the listener, and just in terms of the, the potential for mind control here. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, it's funny that, that, you know, on Facebook, on my regular Facebook, the boring one, <laughs> I got quite a few of them. But yeah, that's that's the boring one. And it came, a memory came up because I had scanned in a picture from my uh, cadet days. And it came up just yesterday. And I shared it, you know, and then someone that was in the program with me, cadet program, you know, we, we had a little chat about about that. And it was I had to be, oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 11, 12, 12, 13. And so this is the, called the Civil Air Patrol, and it's the civilian auxiliary of the United States Air Force. It was, uh, the program was based out of a Naval Reserve Center. And I know we're, we're mixing military branches, but the Naval Reserve Center, uh, one in Massachusetts that I lived in at the time, they had this Civil Air Patrol program that would use their facility. So we'd had our cadet meetings, and we learned about aerospace um, because it was an auxiliary of the Air Force. And we, we did, you know, basically little young, you know, kids marching around. And I was so drawn to that military stuff. One of our trips was that we went to uh, Quantico, which is um, a Marine base. It's the it's the FBI training center, Quantico, Virginia. So we went there for a whole week. You know, it was like a fun trip. You know, military kids going down to Quantico. Uh, they let us stay on the base. And I, lots, lots of lost memory, lots of blank time there. I remember bits and pieces of it. They moved our sleeping quarters three times when we got there. It just felt like there was a big void as far as what, what that experience was like for me. And I had mentioned to Yuri that I went to this place, can't remember much. And uh, he, he had shared that um, he heard it was a CIA, NSA 
uh, Mind Control Training Center, which, which really hit home for me because it just, you, once again, can't prove or disprove. The government's never going to tell you that stuff. But um, just the fact that the memories and the, the fact that we went there and also just that there was a, a lot of lost time for me in, in that place. And and also with mind control programs, they use, you know, all sorts of stuff, whether it's church groups, Cub Scouts or military cadet programs like this to indoctrinate kids to get them conditioned. And so I think it's quite possible that that McQuantico trip and the lost time, there might have been some programming or conditioning going on there. It's hard to say. Well, you know, just from reading your book, you've obviously had a lot of occult and paranormal experiences. Were there any other kids in the program that had similar sorts of experiences that you know of? It's funny you mention that because right before I came to New Zealand, I was in contact with a guy who's a few years older. And I was still just, you know, drinking a lot and and just trying to to figure out if if someone else could, could remember things or maybe conversely have memories of no memory, if that makes sense. So having lost memories and being aware of it or lost time. And uh, he got really he got really pissy with me and just said, "Ah, oh, you're crazy." Because I was trying to find the other the other kids and see if they had any bizarre experiences, and n- none of them really indicated that. So, you know, whether it was just me, you know, uh, overthinking it or trying to attribute something to mind control that really wasn't there, I'm not sure. Uh, but he he went into the navy, went to Annapolis, and he he really he made a, a lifetime, you know, of it. Uh, but also with mind control, if a proper mind controlled person is never going to know that they're mind controlled. It's never going to stop and think, wow, what's going on with my life? It's or my thoughts, my, my behaviors. They're bizarre in comparison to everyone else. So there must be something wrong. Then they start investigating. Proper mind control, you're not supposed to ever know you're mind controlled or question it. That That's the perfectly mind controlled slave. But it's not, a, it's not a perfect, just like with computer software, none of it's perfect. And there are people that will wake up from it and then they start investigating and that's when you go into the minefield of your own psyche because the mind control will <laughs> doesn't want to be you know dismantled so it's going to fight it's like a war within within your own mind it's going to fight to stay and, and part of you is trying to fight to to get rid of it or to understand it and it's completely unprovable it's just going on within your mind and that's it's that's a dangerous place so you got to be be ready for that let me get conspiratorial for just a second. I used to work for a newspaper. It was my first job out of college and got to know a lot of the local police officers and, and sheriff deputies. And a lot of them would go to training exercises at Quantico, you know, for a week or two weeks at a time. Is it possible that local law enforcement could have been subjected to the same sort of mind control techniques at these retreats, at these training camps? I mean... It just seems like, you know, especially now when you when you just turn on the nightly news, there's always some sort of drama going on with police officers and civilians. And I just wonder, I watch, I've seen videos of just, of cops just shooting people randomly with no provocation. Is it possible that, that they're triggered by something, that, that they may be under some sort of influence? Uh, I, I think most definitely, Ryan. Absolutely. You know, there are different types of mind control. You think, okay, why does mind control exist anyway? What, what, what's the point of it? I mean, in the end, people always want to control other people. If you go back to ancient times, different tribes, somebody wants to control the masses. Uh, so control, you know, as a theme, as a very general theme, then you want to take a person and make them like literally a robot that will march to your tune, a flesh and blood robot that you could use for anything. One of the uses is having having a military and whether it's military or police, having a large group of people that will, you know, basically carry out your agenda, which is to to you know keep the population under control. So take part of the population, which is the police, and then have them, w- without thinking, you know, respond to your commands, which is to you know definitely keep the the populace under control, brutalize them, you know, keep keep them in fear. And mind control techniques from Montauk supposedly. You know, a lot of the experiments, there were multiple, where they used, um, you know, radio waves uh, with that radar tower. They used radio waves to try and beam the mind control, you know, invisibly through the air uh, and, and to select people. So going to Quantico, these, these cops, uh, they, they might have very well, you know, used that to, to uh, program them, get into their subconscious to desensitize them to violence. So they violence to them is not violence so they think that's just my my regular behavior to whack someone with with a billy club or a baton or what have you and also to uh carry out orders without thinking you know thinking i don't want to hurt someone or oh that that's not right morally but to do it quickly and without thought and and for them to go to quantico there might have been the 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 right facility or instruments or or what have you for them to get a hit 
or, or a tuning up, if you will, uh, and then then you send them off back back into their daily lives as cops. So most definitely. Well, you equated to mind control to computer software, and then you just mentioned too, you know, having the the radio tower on Montauk that could sort of blast out those those radio frequencies, and then obviously the human brain we know at this point is acts as more of a receiver of these sorts of signals and and frequencies. So I'm wondering, we've seen a, a large increase, obviously, in technology in terms of towers in in the the U.S. I don't know what it's like in New Zealand where you are now, but is there a possibility that you know this software has been just sort of uploaded into the ether, so to speak, and now it's implemented on a mass level? Absolutely, and, and I think the United States, um, in particular, is part of that that kind of grand experiment because now living outside the states uh, and even if you go across the border to Canada that's probably a better example you look at the crime statistics and, and, and just the, the way people live it just seems once you cross the border everyone is just seems more rational and, and sane and calm whereas in the states there's this frenetic fervor frothing at the mouth this just everyone is all keyed up and 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 you know the, the violence is so prevalent um, and I'm, I'm generalizing but but I mean it's it's definitely a pattern, uh, and, and a lot of people from other countries, uh, they think just the states are crazy. They, they watch, and they go, "Wow!" I mean, it's entertaining and bizarre for them, but they think, "What's going on over there?" Uh, and I think, you know, with the cell phone towers and all of that stuff, they can take the the mind control frequencies and then beam them right through so so conveniently, and it, and people are constantly getting hit with that 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 undercurrent, um, which is to keep them. In a state of fear, in a state, a reactionary state, violent state, you know, this fight or flight thing. They're, they're tapping into people's the reptilian uh, to keep them at a lower vibration. And then, you know, I could definitely see that happening with, with the radio towers. And I think they did perfect that stuff, or at least were on their way to perfecting it at Montauk. And then beaming it to the general populace through cell phone towers, television, you name it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, to individuals as well. Supposedly, they can vector in on a particular individual's frequency because we all have our own individual frequency imprint and then literally beam that that conditioning into them while they're sleeping you don't have to be you know in a chair in a, in a dark room in a basement somewhere getting beaten on and that was part of the original mind control technique is to physically you know uh, subdue someone and, and and beat them to just right to the point of death and then they're wide open and then once someone's wide open at the point of death then you can insert the software, and then they they will come out of it hopefully, and then not have any memory of it. But it's in their subconscious, and then of course they would have trigger words or sounds or colors or what have you. And then once that's presented to that person, they'll subconsciously remember to act out the the programming sequence. What do you use them for? Sex slaves. I mean, what's the, the most ancient pleasure? Who wouldn't want a flesh and blood robot that you just say a magic word and then they'll perform for you? Or let's say espionage uh, to take uh, a male or female agent and have them use their sexual prowess to to get someone to give them information and then you've got assassins uh, you know assassin programming people that are sent to kill a particular person you could do that with the mafia you could do that uh, you know with the cia um i mean you name it uh super soldiers soldiers that are will kill on command and and i think part of their goal was to, to have kind of a psychic warrior uh, a soldier that knew how to manipulate the astral uh, as well as the physical and, and would react without fear or, or, you know, concern about their own health and had enhanced abilities. And then also uh, psychic assassination, someone that could sit in a chair in a room and, and find someone on the astral and, and bombard them from the astral plane to get their physical body to break down uh, and kill them. And just so many different applications uh, you know, for that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think we see that every time there's a quote-unquote terrorist attack, I think that's probably part of that sort of those sacrificial lambs, you know, that that would that they can send in and shoot up a movie theater or a school or wherever, shopping mall, and then what do you know? Every terrorist is never captured. They're always killed, and so we can't question them. We can't question them why they did this, you know, what their motives were, and then and then punish them justly. No, we we have to kill them. I, and I think that's a that's a sign too that that whole those false flags, you know, that you hear so much about in conspiracy circles. That's I, I think is is to your point as well. And you mentioned cell phones. You mentioned in your book that that telephones have long been used as trigger devices for mind controlled slaves, and everybody's got a cell phone in their pocket now. Uh, 
Although I would advise you take it out of your pocket if you're going to walk around with it because you'll kill all your sperm, I think, if you're a man and <laughs> you're going to shrink your ovaries or something if you're if you're a female. But, you know, it's ironic, too, that, that they <laughs> they call these trigger devices or trigger words or trigger colors that you were just talking about those, too. And that's ironic because triggered is now a very popular word online across social media that describes any sort of of stimulus that sends people into a rage and i just wonder how that infiltrated social media and and pop culture so so quickly because it seems like two years ago i never heard that word and now i hear it all the time yeah i I think that with with the the mind control stuff it's it it is leaking out and i'm not sure if it's leaking out because it's on purpose or it's it's damage control uh so you see you know like let's say the super bowl you know and the katie perry doing you know it's it's obviously this this big ritual you know, the whole world's watching. They're using the, the collective mental energy, you know, to, to create something, you know, during this mm-hmm. ritual. So for the word triggered, you know, becoming just this common catchphrase, I, I think it, it, it triggers people just by using the word triggered. It triggers them unconsciously, you know, in a general sense to tap into that, you know, follow the lead of the mind control stuff that's beamed out through our phones, through the, I mean, the television, the word television, you know, get your own vision. They're, they're telling you what to visualize with television. It's been around since the 50s. So that's all a form of mask mind control. And I think with stuff online, you know, just going viral, these these words the kids use, they travel so fast that they're not use the word triggered, but they're actually triggering themselves by by using it. And that's that's the best type of mind control that perpetuates itself. So it doesn't really have to be implemented. It just they just let they just send it out there. And then it just slowly surely snowballs and ricochets off everything. And then, and then it takes care of itself. But but I think ultimately, if we're in the physical plane at this time, nobody's a victim. I think we're all choosing from our, our collective soul groups, choosing the experiences that we have. So if you happen to be, you know, in, in, in Nagasaki, when the nuclear bomb goes off, your soul, you know, it sounds a bit harsh, but your soul chose that experience. If someone, you know, is murdered or commits murder and and all the the ramifications and and the repercussions, part of the soul group's experience, it's all just an experience here in the physical plane. And if we label things good or evil, I think we we, we lose sight of the fact that it's it's all like a chessboard, really. In your book, you outline or mention a few different types of programming. Uh, I'm just going to run through a quick list here of things that you've you've written about, and you know maybe we could talk about a couple of them. I think most people that are into this sort of subject are aware of of monarch programming, for example. But you've also mentioned some other things like Tinkerbell programming, Dragonfly programming, time sensitive programming, interdimensional programming. So I was wondering, of these sorts of mind control techniques or, or programs, what's probably the most prevalent, you think? Well, a- among those, I would say, for instance, time-sensitive programming is, is, is more about triggers. So each slave is programmed with triggers so that they can they could be triggered by, you know, let's say a certain time of the month or it could be uh, a certain year. I mean, you have deep sleepers that, you know, let's say – you know, in 2020, um, you know, they, they activate and they wake up and they, they come from their daily lives and all of a sudden the, everything that they need to remember in regards to their programming comes back and then they they go off, you know, somewhere and report for duty. I mean, it, it can be like that. You know, as far as Tinkerbell programming, um, from what I researched and, and learned from Yuri, you know, the you know, as far as with the, with the cartoons, the Disney Tinkerbell, um, you know, someone that never ages, uh, they, they can actually tap into the subconscious you know, of the slave. And, and humans can do amazing things. It's just all conditioning. We're told we can't, you know, uh, lift up a car. We can't because we're taught from day one that we're not able to. So we don't allow our, our you know, innate abilities to, to activate that. But with Tinkerbell programming, you, you basically program somebody's genetics not, not to age uh, in, in the ordinary fashion. And they stay young longer. And then as a result, they're able to be used longer. Because they put a lot of time in, into programming these people, and they want to get as much out of them as they can. Very scientific stuff, at least from their perspective, uh, even though it's, it's never perfect. Another kind of programming is uh, sacrifice ritual programming. And, and this is where it's less physical and more astral. So the astral energy during these, these sacrifice rituals is funneled up to the demonic or the reptilian energies on the astral plane. So physical people will gather together, uh, and they'll conduct one of these gruesome you know, rituals where people are being tortured, killed, all of that trauma energy uh, is then taken by the, the program slave and funneled up to the astral plane where it's absorbed 
or, or, or you know, kind of drank, drank or drunk in by the the reptilian energies, you know, or demonic. Because who the hell knows, really, you know, what's up there? But we know it's some some pretty some pretty negative stuff, at least from our perspective. From their perspective, they're just doing their thing. Sacrifice ritual programming, uh, and then the the psychic assassination. If I'm connected to any of this stuff, I, I would probably lean in that direction, just based on my own reactions when I get angry or upset. You know, I'll think you want to like implode someone's organs. You know, you get pissed off and you have a first reaction. You want to punch them in the face, or mm-hmm. you know, my, in my head, I want to cave in their organs with my thoughts. So I, you have to look at your own mental reflexes and, and kind of trace it back to see. If I don't have any proof, but I have symptoms, what would the most likely direction be? And then all of the occult stuff that I had studied when I was younger about, um, you know, summoning demonic energies and sending them after certain people, which I didn't do, actually. But I, out of curiosity, I wanted to see if that stuff existed. But that's what those conjuring books can be used for. So they're, they're grafting the occult onto weaponizing, you know, uh, mysticism or so weaponizing the occult. And that, that's something that really activates me because it just makes sense you're taking something very occultic non-physical and you're turning it into a weapon and militarizing it basically and so some of the smarter folks in the military that were open-minded enough could really see the use in that of taking something you know that's non-physical and grafting it onto a a military objective which ultimately is a physical objective killing a politician and doing it in such a way that it didn't look like anybody killed them they just they died of a heart attack I mean, you, you put someone in, um, in, in a trance, in a chair, in a basement somewhere in, you know, CIA or wherever, and you've got all this occultic stuff, a photograph of this person. And, and with witchcraft and any uh, occultism, having something that connects to that person etherically. So if I have a photograph of a politician with me, and if they're lucky enough, maybe a physical object that they, they own or something connected, could be a business card, could be a button, anything that connects you to that person through the ethers and then that person will you know go into a trance and then try to travel through the astral plane and connect with them and attack their chakra system so let's say you, you want to attack their heart chakra and there's, there's no distance you know in, in the astral plane if you think you're there you're there instantly so it doesn't matter if they're in russia and you're in you know california or what have you so you, so you travel to that person's energy signature on the astral plane using the the picture something that you're be you're in sympathy with which means in witchcraft or occult terminology connection so you've got that etheric connection with the picture maybe a button or a business card you find their auric field on the astral plane you attack a certain chakra and then ideally that person will die of a heart attack or you give them an aneurysm it could be a number of ways that you can basically look for a weakness in the uh in the chakra system and attack the weakness and I, I didn't learn any of this stuff. It was just in my head. I mean, to be quite honest, I didn't learn any of this even from Yuri. And I get it tingling just thinking about it and I get hyper. So if you look at all of your body reactions and all of the errant thoughts that come in, when you focus on a particular area, that can be some sort of indication as to whether or not you know, it's, it's been, you know, you've been affected by it in your life, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And speaking of tingling, let's get a little weird here. You know, I mentioned Dragonfly as one type of programming. That's a sexual type of programming. And you actually have some nice detail, some weird detail in the book about (laughs) Dragonfly sexual programming. Could you sum that up for the listeners, please? Yeah, I mean, I learned about that through Yuri. Um, And and once again, just to be fair, um, a lot of this stuff I did learn from him doesn't make it true. But for some reason, our lives connected yeah, he and I. This basically, people are used to to have sex with reptilian aliens, if that makes sense, reptilian beings, and they're basically used as battery packs. So these these people will programmed people will have sex with the reptilians, and the reptilians will uh, suck their life force out of them. So they're basically, be, you know, vampiric in a sense, but they're meant to be used over and over again. Um, and this supposedly this this type of sex with these these beings is very much very traumatic. And and it can be you know described as like kind of a mind fuck. It's not just physical. It's about at a soul level, at, at, you know, basically draining someone. So they have these program slaves that are that are able to handle that because supposedly people not everyone can can handle that. They just die basically, you know, or or they're just their their mind is fried and they can't be used again. So so the dragonfly is supposedly someone that is is programmed and able to have sex with a reptilian being. 
for the use of extracting their, their life force energy you know, on, on a regular basis. I'm taking issue with the reptilian part of this just because I've always found that story to be far-fetched. So you're essentially saying, and this is through Yuri, that reptilians exist and that humans are used as sex slaves for them essentially, right? Um, I, I would call it more, um, and it's funny, I'm in my right ear I'm getting a ringing. And I always pay attention whenever I'm on a particular topic, what's going on in my head and in my environment. And I'm getting this this ringing in my ear, which I don't know what the hell it means, but um, quite often programming prompts are downloaded, and they're downloaded in an audible sense. Mm -hmm. I consciously probably can't tell what's happening, but there's this humming that's going right through my ear, almost as if there's a package or something being, who knows? I I don't know. I'm just just, uh, sharing little synchronicities that are occurring at the moment. But I mean, reptilian, everyone views, if a particular energy is in your environment, and let's say you're able to see it uh, you know, with your third eye or even possibly with your physical eye, whatever um, system that you've been instilled with, like with the Christian, you see the devil, you know, with, with, with other cultures, you're going to see a different type of entity. What you're seeing is really a representation of the energy there. And each person, you might see a reptilian I might see, you know, um, a goat with hooves. Uh, another person might see uh, something completely different, uh, all depending on, on how they were conditioned growing up. So it's really a representation of an energy more than seeing a reptile, you know, like with the, the royal family, they turn into reptiles and they eat people. It, it It sounds crazy, but I think it only sounds crazy because of our conditioning. It's like someone saying a human being can't fly. That sounds crazy, but a human being can pick up a truck if the their child's under there and they, they, they summon the strength to do that. So that that's conceivable, but yet a, a reptilian isn't. And it's I think it's, you know, once again, anything's possible. I mean, it really is. Am I saying they exist? Have I seen them? Nope, absolutely not. But it, it's, it, it doesn't make me think that's not possible. Uh, and I have experienced enough stuff that, that would say, hey, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, close the door to it. But yeah, if someone thinks it's nuts, that that's th- their own prerogative. But I think reptilian or demonic type energy does exist and it can manifest either physically or quasi-physically. Some beings you can see physically, they're not really solid. They're, they're in that in-between the physical uh, and the, the astral or the, or the etheric plane. It all depends. Your body is just a, is an interface between realities. And depending on how attuned your body is or your, your viewing mechanism you're going to perceive uh, non-physical things in a different way than, than other people. So it's really, it's very subjective. Well, and, you know, I think you mentioned this a few minutes ago, too, that the term, the reptilian brain, I mean, that's something that, that exists. We've studied that in, in humans and, and other species for centuries, it seems like. So the idea of that is out there. But as far as an actual being, I've just always been sort of cautious about that that kind of stuff. I don't necessarily want to believe in it. Let's just put it that way. But why is sexual ritual and uh, I guess sexual sexual energy in particular so important during these conversations that we're having? Like, why is it so important to these these mind control techniques? Like, why do they want to harvest that from us? Well, I think that that's uh, Ryan. That is the the most potent energy force in the universe. That's 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 how we're created, um, and that's how we can create from within ourselves. I mean, it's it's the most amazing energy. And unfortunately, all of this stuff is layered on top of it because it's meant to control us. Oh, we think sexual thoughts, we feel guilty. It's like so interwoven into humans uh, because it's all of of our control mechanism. Whoever wants to control human beings on the planet doesn't want people to tap into their own ability to create in their lives because then then they can't control them. So it's always... Sexual energy is electrical energy, like orgon energy. Willem uh, Reich, in, in his uh, pioneering research, it, it's you know he connected it with electric, bioelectric energy. That you know the orgasm can, if you can harness that energy in a particular moment and funnel it into an objective, you can manifest something uh, very quickly, uh, as opposed to slowly. Like if you have a wish for something, uh, I want to have a, you know a new car. I want to you know, a new job, make money, and you think about it, it sends that up into the astral plane. If you think about it enough, it'll slowly but surely snowball in the non-physical, and eventually, if you don't negate it with, oh, I'm not going to get the car, you know what I'm saying, I'm going to get this car and I'm not, and then you just constantly negate that, but if you can consistently focus on it and believe it, it will eventually spill into the physical, 
But if you take the power of your orgasm, your sexual energy, and then that will supercharge the manifestation process for whatever you want and, and make it happen that much faster. But you've got you to believe and you've got to be consistent. So these people were, were basically taking a, 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 some, a program slave or somebody that they, you know, would call it a robot and activating their sexual energy and then programming them to actually use that energy for what they want. So it's basically pooling all of this energy and then taking it away from an individual and not letting them use it for, for their own purposes, but for the other person's, uh, for the controller's purposes, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you actually wrote, I'm going to pull a quote here from your book. You said, we can use our sexual energy for creative purposes, but humanity has been distracted with the pleasurable aspect of sexuality and kept from discovering its full potential. That quote's kind of a good encapsulation of what you're saying, is that we can create other beings by you know, having sex and reproducing like that. But then we can also create things within our own sort of psychic power through this same sort of energy. Is, is that what we're talking about? Absolutely, Ryan. A absolutely. Like, for instance, I don't, I never have sex and I don't waste an orgasm ever now. And it's taken me many years to get to this point. But because it's, it's so hard to focus a particular thought when you're in that state, because it's pleasurable and like, whoa, you, you, you just blank out. You want to get lost in it. And, and it's hard to have a, a focused thought that's not a sexual thought during that, that activity. So what I do is I, I focus on something I want to create in my life before I even get into a sexual state. Uh, and then I try to keep it in my mind. And, you know, I'm enjoying whether it's masturbating or sex with a person, which, by the way, is more powerful than doing it yourself. But, you know, if you don't have that option. And then just before your orgasm, keep picturing the thing that you want to create, whatever it might be. Picture it as crystal clear as possible. And the moment you orgasm, picture it again. And then just keep that thought in mind. Some people think, oh, well, I want to think of you know, a person's body or something like that in that moment. But that's that's keeping the, the sexual energy more animalistic, you know, so to speak. And it's also created by the media, you know, and pornography and all that stuff. It's all meant to, to, to drain your creative energy into these lower lower areas, and that can be fed upon by vampiric energies on the astral. One thing I notice is that as soon as you orgasm, these things will come in. These things will, will swoop in. It's like once you're open, you can create but you can also be manipulated. So there's that double-edged sword where you really have to clear your space and you have to focus those thoughts. Otherwise, once you're open, it's either you can create or something else can swoop in and then extract your energy. And I found that there are astral beings around me. Uh, I used to get really cranky after I orgasm, angry, cranky, drained. I just didn't want to didn't want to be around anybody, and I was so edgy afterwards. And that was because of all the astral crap that I had drawn to me with my, you know, demon summoning experiments, stuff, the residual stuff that hung around. So once you have your space cleared, then you can truly focus your thoughts on that orgasm. It, it's taken me years and years of practice, and it's still not perfect. And each time I do it, I think, okay, how did I do? Did I really picture what I wanted clearly, or was I distracted at that very moment? And sometimes fears can come in, I've noticed, things that you're afraid of, things that worry you whether it's health issues or the world you know being blown up or being cheated on or something like that um, I've noticed that once you have the orgasm you're trying to focus on something to create you can also have your fears swoop in and that's because of that astral stuff around you so it's almost like you want to clean your astral or clean your arc field before you do that and that'll increase the effectiveness of your your manifestation ability so, I know it sounds crazy I've been doing it for years no and, and no I finally it I don't think it sounds crazy at all, man. But I do want to know how one can clear their auric field to better harness this. Uh, in a number of ways. I mean, I would say make one of the first things about cleansing is, is keeping your body clean. Because, you know, as above, so below, as within, so without. Clean your physical body. I mean, have a, a you know, shower. Um, you can put, put yourself in a salt circle. You, you can do your own kind of banishing ritual. You can say out loud, hey, my, my space is clear of negative energies. It's, Definitely saying it verbally is going to have a stronger effect, even though it sounds strange. You know, you're saying it, but your your larynx vibrates. Words create. They send vibrations through the ethers. By saying that, you can definitely create it more so. Definitely do something, and you don't have to have some super organized ritual, but something that tells your mind that you've made the effort, and that in and of itself is is going to help clear your space. And that's it's it's really critical. I've had wasted a lot of orgasms because you just oh wait a minute something else popped into my head right when I wanted to create because that's when you're 
most vulnerable, but also your most powerful. And if you can kind of scrub that whole space around you, the clear picture will come in your head much more effectively. And you want to keep it there as long as possible. And it's, it's amazing. You'll see stuff happen in your life because it doesn't happen in a linear way. Sometimes weird stuff happens. You go, how did I, oh, I didn't, that's not what I wanted to create. Why is that? And then you have to analyze you know, what you did wrong. Well, I've wasted a ton of orgasms, to be honest. But let me ask you something. I remember I was I had one with someone else a couple years ago. And when it happened, you have your eyes closed, right? Like most of the time that this is happening. And I got this really intense vision with my eyes closed of geometric patterns like almost similar to like the way somebody on a psychedelic would describe seeing you know those sacred geometrical shapes what the hell like where would that have come from have you ever heard of something like that (laughs) yeah i've had some visions of of geometric shapes living geometry almost beings that um that moved as if they were alive but they were geometric shapes and it sounds like you're tapping into something on on a very deep level like you know the fabric seeing the fabric of the universe or seeing, you know, the the etheric or the astral geometry of things. And it sounds like you pierced the veil, you know, and you were kind of, you were shown shown something. Well, you were in a state where you could access those things. Yeah. And I just, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but I remember when it was happening that I was so focused on it for that moment that like, you know, when you focus on something with your eyes closed and then you open your eyes, you almost feel like you're not gonna be able to see this reality again because it takes a few seconds for the vision to fade away. And then for whatever your landscape is here, like in this life, like that comes like kind of fading back in. I felt like I was not going to come back from that for that moment. Like I had my eyes closed for like so long. It was only probably just a few seconds, but I saw those patterns and those shapes. And then when I opened my eyes back up, they were still there and they slowly faded out. Out, but I thought like just for that moment that I was not going to get my actual vision back if that makes sense yeah, it sounds like your optic nerves were tattooed you know or imprinted you know with that energy and because it was so potent that 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 the residue you know it remained for quite a while and it also I think it also indicates that the potency of what you were tapping into that that the residual you know image would be there slowly but surely even in your with your physical sight overlaid on top of it if you can get to that place or try and access that with your sexuality you can do some amazing stuff but it takes discipline and because we're all conditioned that we want to think of you know let's say you want to think of boobs in your orgasm or an ass or whatever like it's that's our, our animalistic conditioning but if you can take it to the next level and and not think oh i wanted to think of boobs instead of thinking about you know creating success in my life or creating this specific thing you might think you're wasting it in that sense, whereas now I think it's wasted when there's there's some other kind of more primal thing that's there. So right. it's everyone's choice, but it's, unfortunately we get conditioned with kind of draining that energy instead of having it travel up our spine uh, in, into this you know place where we can actually create. Versus as soon as it gets up to the root chakra, it gets dispersed horizontally into you know thinking about something that was more base. But it's a discipline. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to get back with that girl again, just to feel that again. Anyways, right. you not to get experiences. They're amazing, yeah. right? Not to get too personal there, but holy shit, yeah. So you mentioned something a couple times here that I actually okay. So let me start that sentence over. I recently spoke with a guy who I think you're familiar with, named uh, Chris Garitano. That's for sure. Yeah, he he made the the feature length documentary, uh, the Montauk Chronicles, uh, a few years ago, and he mentioned. I just spoke with him recently, and he mentioned something to me during our conversation that you also wrote about in your book, and you've actually dropped it here and there during this conversation a couple times and what i'm talking about is vampirism uh you called it specifically in your book you called it psychosexual vampirism i don't think chris went that far with his description but he did say vampires are very real and they survive off of pig's blood so based on what you know about vampirism you know what's your understanding of it and and how does the psychosexual definition that you put on it relate back to all this Wow, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not sure where, where, he, where he's coming up with the pig's blood, but it, it could be a metaphor for something else. I'm not quite sure. But from the, the psychosexual aspect, um, with the Montauk project, supposedly uh, they had this Montauk chair, and the, this the chair was underground, but on top of this huge what they call a delta T antenna, and it was all of this electrical. It's all this. They're basically taking electrical en- energy and then grafting it onto bioelectric energy or, or human etheric energy, which it has an electrical component. So you've got your electricity, you know, and the plugs in the wall, then you've got the electricity, the subtle electricity 
that your body creates because our bodies have their own auric field. The planet has its own auric field. So you've got all of this subtle electrical energy, and that is definitely created and enhanced by our sexual energy as well. So at Montauk, they basically drained kids of their sexual energy in that Montauk chair and in other places and then pooled it and used it to open up dimensional doorways, used it to manifest physical things from pure thought. And so they basically, when I say psychosexual vampirism, they're draining the sexual energy of people and then pooling it and using it as battery pack, if you will, to then open doorways to other realities, travel through time to create things. I mean, it just it sounds mind blowing and it sounds like so diametrically opposed to our conditioning growing up that we think it's got to be science fiction. There's no scientific proof of this. It's all rubbish. Maybe it is, but it's out there. And when things are out there and they're discussed, we could easily be discussing other stuff that makes no sense to us, but we're not. We're discussing this. So there's got to be something to it. Maybe it's 30 percent correct. Maybe 80 percent. I don't know. But with the psychosexual vampirism, it's it's basically you can vampirize someone in many different ways, but they took it to another level and they use technology to interface and to and to to extract that energy to create things. And that's that that your pure sexual energy. Yeah, so that ties into what we were talking about. And I don't know where the hell he came up with the pig's blood thing. I haven't done any research on that since we since I spoke to him. But that was just sort of a... It was an, it was an interesting correlation because it's not something that he's put in his films or his one film, I guess, his documentary. He doesn't really talk about vampirism in there. It just sort of came up in the conversation and he mentioned that. So I was interested... You know, you actually wrote about it on the psychosexual level, so I just didn't know if I didn't know if Chris was talking about actual vampires like you see in you know horror movies where they're drinking human blood, but a really weird correlation there. Uh, speaking of animals and things like that, why the hell did you buy an African baboon tarantula, and how does this relate back to mind control? Maybe. Ah, uh, that's that's funny because I, I I always look at synchronicity, and, and on Thursday we had a, a meeting at work, and I had to had to speak at this meeting. And then afterwards, uh, one of the guys uh, had mentioned about immersion therapy, and he just went on and on about it. And he said, oh, there's, there's a therapy where you, you actually go towards the very thing that you're afraid of. And he mentioned spiders specifically, which I thought, and I said, oh, I used to own these tarantulas that I used to try and purge myself of the fear. And to be fair, arachnophobia is one of the most prevalent uh, phobias. It's, it's not some unique type of phobia. But what I did, I mean, I think at that time I had stopped the demon conjuring experiments, but I had lots of baggage, astral baggage following me around, jerking me around, you know, just I was still stuck in that. You can't just get rid of those energies because you're not doing the exact ritual anymore. Once the doors open, they follow you around for quite a bit and they make a mess in your life. So I think it was uh, I thought, OK, I'm afraid of spiders, but they they excited me so much. So there's an attraction and a repulsion. I was terrified of them, but I got high off of it. So as I was getting high off of the fear, and I thought, okay, let me somehow tap into this fear, and maybe with that extra heightened energy, I could poke a hole in, in the reason that I was so afraid of spiders. So it was kind of like this half-assed driving a car recklessly you know, through the, through the woods. You, know, you might hit a tree any moment, but you're getting a, a rush out of it, uh, and you might get to your destination. So it was very, very much a reckless thing on, on a psychic level. Because I could have easily, you know, messed up my brain and I, I did some really stupid stuff. But I was wanted to take the high that I got from the fear and see if I could somehow uncover the reason for it. And, and then, of course, I was drinking. And then once you drink, your energy field opens up. And then I all this trauma came back and I started crying. And then I freaking, oh, and then I cut myself and, and let the, the drip the blood on the spider because I thought, the blood has electrical energy and maybe the spider and I could commune and somehow I could speak to the spider and ask it, why am I afraid of spiders? Or it would unlock a memory. So it was just all this random, reckless experimentation, hoping, desperately hoping to find out what the hell is wrong with me. Because I would compare my experiences with other people and they go, what's, you're fucking nuts, man. You know, because <laughs> sometimes if you share an experience, people go, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've been through that. Oh yeah, that makes sense to me. And then you feel kind of normal. But I would ping that off of people occasionally, just how my brain worked and, and my behaviors. And nobody came back with a, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, that's that's happened to me as well. And then I felt, okay, I'm, I just felt alone with who I was and how I was behaving. And there was no other connection to other people with it. 
Who are the uh, cults of the shadow, and what role do they play here, maybe? That was connected more to, to Aleister Crowley and uh, Crowley and Montauk and, and all of the, the occultism that, that's used to program people and graft demons into people's energy fields with programming. That, that, that's where that stuff combines, because I had initially thought, you've got an occult obsession and you've got a mind control conspiracy obsession, never the twain shall meet. And I thought that they weren't connected, and eventually I figured out that they were. But Cults of the Shadow, that, that comes from Aleister Crowley and one of his contemporaries, Kenneth Grant. And, and these are people that, basically cults, that um, affiliate themselves with a particular current. And by current, I mean they're energetic currents that have a particular flavor to them. And uh, there's a, a current called the Ophidian Current. And people that are in, into the occult or understand Crowley or have studied Kenneth Grant as well. He was um, a, bit, a bit in the darker direction as far as uh, cultism. But these people would meditate, put themselves in a particular state, and actually connect to a frequency. And the cults of the shadow connected, as far as I know, to the Ophidian current, which is a darker current, or a more reptilian current. I'm not saying dark is a negative, I'm not judging it, but that's our affiliation with it, is it's, it's got a heavier energy to it. And I was when I was blacking out, I was writing down cults of the shadow. Uh, so stuff was spewing out of my unconscious, and I was trying to after I wrote stuff down, I would wake up and go, what did I write? Well, and I was trying to find patterns in it to see if I could kind of unlock my unconscious. The reason I brought that up at this point was because you, I thought you described the cult of the shadow as a black magic spider cult. Is that accurate or did I misnote that? I was connecting it with spiders and there are definitely offshoots of the, the Ophidian current and of those cults. And I think in the blackouts, I was thinking there must be, um, you know, a, a cult that, that worships spiders. And I did, I did come across something along those lines. So they specifically, you know, worship the spider and, and all of the negative affiliations that go with them. Because you can choose one or the other. Spider creates things, creates webs of energy, very positive. And then you can also take the darker aspect. And that really depends on your own experience with them. Some people love spiders. They hold them, play with them, you know, and then there are other people who... I think it's with negative anchors. If you know about the concept of negative anchors, once you've had a bad experience with something, it kind of stays in your unconscious. So if you grew up and, you know, you think spiders are bad, a spider bit you, or your parents said spiders should be stepped on, it's kind of always going to be in your head that spiders are negative. And then also someone else that might tell you growing up that spiders are beautiful, you never should kill one, it's bad luck. That's going to be your experience of spiders for the rest of your life. So it can go either way. But, but as far as the cults of the shadow, I did come across something about a spider cult, you know, where they worship spiders and they, they, they tapped into them energetically. And it also came up in blackout. So some of that stuff I really don't know the origin of, except it was in my unconscious. There's not always a logical connection to the many of those experiences, unfortunately. Well, you, okay, so, you know, the cults of the shadow, if I remember correctly, you know, you're talking about the Ophidian current, which I think has to do with a snake specifically. And then it also sort of connects... The cults of the shadow connect to this Tibetan angle to all of this. Are you familiar with the black sun and that connection between Montauk and Tibetan lore or mysticism? Yeah, yeah I mean, to a, to a degree. Peter Moon, uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Peter Moon. He, he wrote the second and third uh, Montauk connected books. So the first one, I think, was Preston and Nichols. And then Peter Moon uh, carried on with the next two books, you know, connecting Montauk to, to Tibet and the black sun. Um, and it, that connects back to the Nazis as well. I don't see a direct connection versus a synchronistic connection. And that's what Peter Moon writes about a lot is not these direct parallels to things, but synchronistic parallels, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And the Nazis had sent um, an expedition to Tibet, Heinrich Himmler. He was uh, the SS chief. And uh, they sent an expedition there. They, all, they had a few different agendas, from what I understand. They, they wanted to explore whether or not th there was a group of pure Aryans that are connected to Tibet and whether or not they, they were still there. Uh, and then also to, to, you know, basically find out about their occultism so they could bring it back to, to Hitler and help, help win the war with it. Uh, Himmler was uh, very much into the occult. There was a recent, they had found a, a, a whole pile of books in Czechoslovakia. I think it was just last year. He had about 13,000 books on occultism and witchcraft. So, so these, these guys were heavily into weaponizing the occult, and that, that's what it comes down to. And they sent, they sent a group to Tibet to, to try and you know, do some research and to bring back some, some, some really potent stuff that they could utilize uh, with the war. 
Yeah, you also mentioned, too, that Aleister Crowley has a connection to Montauk. What is that connection exactly? Do you know? Once again, a synchronistic connection. Crowley supposedly, well, actually, I, I think it's pretty much confirmed that he, he spent uh, a summer uh, in Montauk in a tent on the beach um, in 1918. And you think, oh, okay, Montauk Project, you know, it's obviously started the early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. But he had he'd been to Montauk and he recognized it um, as a very powerful place uh, geomantically, you know, energetically, because Montauk, Long Island is, is separate from the, you know, from the mainland. And supposedly it's part of Atlantis that never sunk. And, and it's got the, the connection to ley lines and, and energy. They, they moved the Montauk project to, I believe it was Atlanta, Dobbins Air Force Base in Atlanta. They moved operations there because there was too much focus on Montauk itself after all of the, the books came out. Then they found they couldn't get the same results there, and that was because of the, of the location physically. So whether or not they moved back to Montauk, I don't know. But the first phase of the Montauk project ended in 1983, supposedly. I always do the caveat, supposedly, because anyone that speaks declarative statements, unless they have, they know for sure, I always want to put that, that's supposedly what happened. So, yeah, Crowley was in Montauk in 1918, and he recognized the connection. Then you've got the Cameron family, or Clan Cameron. Camerons are supposedly a mystical family, a mystical bloodline, had potent psychic powers. Uh, and there was a woman named Marjorie Cameron. And Marjorie, um, who was described by, um, uh, I don't know if you guys have you heard of Kenneth Anger. Kenneth Anger is an underground filmmaker and also connected to Jimmy Page. So all these people have these, these connections, and now I'm going off into the Led Zeppelin curse. But Marjorie Cameron uh, was married to Jack Parsons, and Jack Parsons was a, a pioneer uh, a NASA a rocket scientist. I mean, this guy was, you know, he was pioneering in, in developing, I think it was solid rocket fuel. Uh, and so the, the, the space program that we have now, the, the rocket program, without this guy, uh, wouldn't be where it is. Parsons was also into Crowley, into the occult, heavily into it. He even had this, he bought a separate house, this house that everybody came to, like a commune, and they all had, you know, sex ritual, and they all did magic rituals. Jack Parsons is also connected and did rituals with uh, Mr. Scientology, you, you know, the, the founder of Scientology, uh, yeah. L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. So you've got all these people connected, Hubbard, Parsons. Crowley, who uh, Parsons and Crowley were in connection, uh, writing letters back and forth. And then you've got Marjorie Cameron. She was married to Parsons. Then she went off with Hubbard. And uh, there was a movie about L. Ron Hubbard that actually depicts them. So Marjorie Cameron is connected to Clan Cameron. Duncan Cameron was the mystic that was the primary uh, Montauk chair uh, person, also related you know, through Clan Cameron. He was the one that was used in the chair. Uh, and they drained his sexual energy and they all used him as kind of a psychic plug-in you know, bioelectrically to harness his energy and then open portals uh, to other times. And then once they had the portals open, they somehow computerized, they found a way to lock in the coordinates so they didn't need him again because they had everything locked into the computer so they could, re they could recreate that and open up specific time portals without using him later. Um, so I know I went off in a million different directions. <laughs> but the, the Peter Moon books talk about synchronicity the synchronistic connections to things, not necessarily the direct correlation. Because Crowley was in Montauk in 1918. Obviously, he died, you know, way before the Montauk Project. And then you've got the, the Cameron family, all somehow connected to Crowley. Then you've also got uh, the, the Crowley occult stuff. That I mean, not that he invented it, but the they used all of this, all these occult rituals in conjunction with the Montauk Project to graft demonic energies, you know, onto the subjects to control them, to amplify their energy. Uh, so they're, they're merging the occult and the physical um, and, and using it and, and weaponizing it, basically. I know it sounds like it's all over the place, but it's it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, and it all really does seem to be connected on some level. So it's On some level, but it's not the usual level that we would expect, right, I think. Right, right. And, and speaking of connections, though, I, I do want to see if you could explain this reincarnated batch of 1972, which I think relates to the Montauk boys, but it also may relate to the 72 demons of the Ars Goetia. Part of that was, was my own connection, or part of my, my own, uh, that, that I didn't get from Yuri or anyone else. It was more of an intuitive thing. But it, as far as I know, it's never been documented. But supposedly among people connected to Montauk, they had they would have so many Montauk boys, and, and they were, of course, perfecting this, this way of programming them. Uh, and then also 
course, broadcasting mind control through the through the the, the tower, the Sage radar as well. But they also had this. So there are many offshoots of what Montauk was doing. Part of it was the Montauk Boys program to create super soldiers. Uh, there were many different little groups of Montauk Boys. Some were programmed to perform rituals. Some were programmed as psychic warriors or super soldiers. They they were just experimenting these crazy guys, you know, trying to see what they could do with the human body and and what powers these these kids had. So supposedly there was a group in 72, which is obviously very early. That was the year I was born. But there was very early in the Montauk Project. And supposedly they had gone overboard with their torture. Because the, the, the key to programming somebody is to push them to the edge of death. And then they're wide open. And it's almost like an orgasm if you think about it. Being on the verge of death and an orgasm is, is, has been called the tiny death, if you will. Because you are in that similar state. Either you're just about to die through torture or you're just about to orgasm. You're kind of the same thing. If you think it gets you to that same psychic state, even though one is through pain and the other one might be through pleasure. So supposedly they killed a whole batch of them because they went overboard. Something went wrong, but they still needed those those souls. So they basically grabbed the souls and they put them back into separate bodies because they couldn't waste all the work they did on their energy fields. If that makes sense, because you've got these these souls that have all of this this programming in their energy field. And then if they die, they're going to go off to, to some other place, some other reality, the next level of incarnation. They said, no, we've put a lot of work into these these kids. They somehow grabbed their energy fields, located them, and pulled them back into new bodies so they wouldn't wouldn't lose their lose all the work they'd done on them. So the physical bodies died, but then they, they took the, the souls of the life force, and then they, they jammed it back into new bodies, basically, and then pushed out the souls. I mean, it sounds very credible. They, they have the ability, I think, to, to actually contain someone's energy field, their, their life force, and put it into an electromagnetic like prison. So imagine someone that can never go on naturally to the next step in life. Once they die, they move on, they reincarnate, or who knows what. Instead, they were saving these uh, energy fields of these people and never letting them go, pulling them back, putting them back into bodies and utilizing all of the work they've done and put into them. Then you've got Goetia, and Goetia has you know, supposedly the 72 demons that you can summon in Goetia. And then the Illuminati always use number they're very obsessed about numerology and numbers and those connections so the whether or not they were experimenting with goetia and those demons in connection to programming on in that year in particular and then it just so happens that you know that that it might have been specific that that programming to goetia i'm not sure but that was more of an intuitive connection okay yeah i mean i was just curious about that you talked about yuri and your relationship with him and he wrote a book several years ago, and on the back of it was a list of symptoms that could possibly indicate if you were what he called being specifically programmed. And, and then he also claims that, that the entire population is generally programmed via television, cell phone towers, advertising, etc., which is then enhanced by things like GMOs and chemical additives. But in terms of being specifically programmed, that, that only a very small percentage of the population has that. This basically means that certain people are targeted because they have the genetics or ancestry that's desirable for mind control what sort of genetics or ancestry are we talking about here exactly with the nazis they they they, they surmise that the, the blue bloods or people with that that um the nordic features blonde hair blue eyes uh you know red hair green eyes etc and, and yuri um i don't know where he got the information from said that people with, with those characteristics have a certain enzyme that allows the programming to anchor more effectively so it doesn't really make them special, but it just makes them more programmable. And there are certain certain genetics where programming just doesn't take. It, it doesn't latch on and, and, and embed itself as effectively. So the Nazis de- definitely looked into, especially in the death camps, supposedly, they were experimenting with twins, with, with, with certain genetic streams. How can we make this programming more effective? Some people, they wake up out of their programming or they just don't follow it. And they, they eventually, through a lot of scientific study, came up with certain genetic traits and then also ancestry, if someone is in a family, whether it's generational abuse or generational witchcraft or, or what have you, you pass on your programming to your kids, you know, to, to your bloodline. So that means they come out kind of already indoctrinated. Their, their, their body, their energetics, their, their org field is kind of primed and ready for that. So it's a lot easier to program people that have it in their in their bloodline. So you've got one bloodline or one type of bloodline, the Aryan people supposedly uh, but then you can also have someone that's got mexican in them but they have an, a recessive gene for the blue blood so what have you or the recessive gene for that area genetics so you can't just look at someone physically and go okay i don't see any blonde hair or blue eyes 
And I think you also mentioned that you've got so you've got what brown eyes and you've got reddish hair. And I, I've got the same thing. And I thought, oh wait a minute, I don't have these genes, so I can't have any programming in me. But it's also recessive genes. And, and you and I actually both. I think you've mentioned you, we've got my grandfather was a pure redhead, and I think you've got red hair in your family as well. So that means that those enzymes are there. But then someone else could say, you know what? There are so many people that have this. You know what makes them special? And that's where the ego gets gets involved. Is people that have this, they're supposedly victims. They they hold it as a badge of honor, like ah, I was chosen to be programmed and, and enslaved. And and that's where the ego can be used. And and that's why you get these people that you know I, I was a victim, and they've got websites up. And I, I did it with my book. I, I needed to do it as kind of a, a cathartic thing. But yes, there are people that can easily say, well, you, you're actually either trying to make money off it or get attention off of it. And that's where it gets really messy. Well, last question for you then, man. How can one be sure that they are free of mind control? In my opinion, you, you can't really. Once It's almost like taking a mirror and smashing it. You, you can put the mirror back together. There's still going to be those cracks there. It's still going. It's never going to be a perfect mirror again. You know, like if, you're, if you have your soul or your, your original energy field and it was programmed, you were tortured, it was smashed. You can bring it back together to some cohesive sense of, okay, I can, I can look in the mirror, but you're always going to have that reflection come back at you with the cracks. And then also another analogy I use is if you take two different types of metal and you've got your original metal and you've got the programming metal, if you melt them both and you mix them together and you let the metal cool, and it becomes one piece of metal. How are you going to pick those bits of metal out? Can you remelt it and still extract everything that was foreign so you can have them both separate metals again? I just don't think it's possible. But that's not a doom and gloom, you know, kind of a, a prognosis. That's more of, you know what, you can learn to live with it. You need to know what your triggers are. You need to know what activates you and affects you. You have to be very mindful of what puts you off in that tailspin. There, there are so many program people, they can't keep track of all of them. And some of them were just experiments. And then supposedly they have a database and they can keep track of your art field and see what you're up to. Somehow, me getting away from the States and, and coming to New Zealand, and I still had trouble when I got here, has definitely given me more of a grasp on being healthy, you know, mentally and, and functioning. And so I, I don't know if somehow there are grids of energy in, in geographic locations that certain program people, if they, if they live in them, they're going to be more triggerable. And then if they get out of them, maybe the, the, the control isn't as evident. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I just knew that I had to, had to get out of that place. And I did. And I found writing, and I found that that's a way to keep me involved in that subject, but not so much where I'm actually being controlled by it, if that makes sense. Yeah, so can absolutely. you get rid of programming? I, I don't think so. But that doesn't mean it's – and there's no way to know. Your mind is such a labyrinth of twists and turns, and you know, programming has all these little loops to keep you programmed. But the key is, to, I think, to know your triggers and to be disciplined and not expose yourself to those triggers. But the problem is when you're triggered – you there's a programmed release of neurochemicals of pleasure so once you get in that triggered state you feel good and you go wow it's like a drug and then you want more and more of it and it perpetuates itself but the key is to find a new drug or a new thing that really turns you on makes you happy and for me i found writing about this subject matter but not necessarily directly involved and it somehow has kept me you know not in that place where i want to be triggered all the time and just go crazy because that just makes a messy life so yeah, can't get rid of it, but you need to be mindful of what your specific triggers are. I think that's the key. Absolutely, man. And I'm very grateful for your time here today. And I know you got to get going now. So please do tell the people that are listening where they could keep up with you online if you want to promote any social media. Oh, uh, hey, I, I appreciate that, Ryan. Um, well, I mean, right now, I mean, if you if you could share links to my, to my books, that that would be great. But right now, I'm just about finishing a, a book on the Led Zeppelin curse, um, and I'm going to be writing it under my own name. And I'm gonna I'll have a website as well. I, my my wife's really good with that stuff. She's going to create a website, and uh, it's just it's just fun. I mean, I, I work a you know a nine to five type job. It's just it's it's necessary, but it's boring as hell. This stuff is a lot more entertaining. Keeps me happy. Keeps me you know excited about life and about being creative so that's why i why i do it but as far as a website not, not nothing available just yet but once once it's available i'll just i'll flick it to you through uh you know through email or through, on twitter and then i'd really appreciate it we can like i said help each other that'd be fantastic well i was going to say you do have a twitter account that people could follow if they're interested specifically in the led zeppelin book that you're writing right yeah yeah definitely it's just uh look up zeppelin curse or led zeppelin curse on twitter 
and it's got uh, a snippet of my book cover with Jimmy Page on it, and it's just a fascinating connections with the occult, with with Jimmy Page, with with Crowley, with Loch Ness. I mean, there's so much stuff going on there. I have a couple of books planned, uh, and it just weaves in all of this mind control with the music industry, you know, Stairway to Heaven with that back masking theory. There's so many neat things uh, in there, and it's just it's for entertainment. If you like this stuff, you're into it, you know, it, 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 and it fills your time and you get a kick out of it, then that's great. You know, it's not about forcing it down people's throats. If they're into that subject, fantastic. And, and the book itself is going to be a combination of information and de- definitely uh, speculation because Jimmy Page never really specifically talks about his Crawley obsession and, and what, what he did at Boleskine House, which is the, the place that it's a house that Crawley owned in the Loch, Loch Ness and also a house that Page had bought because Crawley owned it. So we, we don't know what, what really happened there. So there's going to be a little speculation, but it's all based on, I think, my, my knowledge of the occult and, and the, the stuff that I can, I think, uh, speculate on in an educated way uh, because of my occult background. But anyway, Zeppelin Curse, yeah, on Twitter, and um, you know, the book's going to be, it's its due to be out in early to mid-October, and then we'll go from there. I look forward to hopefully speaking to you again about that very soon. Yeah, Ryan, hey, we'll stay in touch, and like I said, I'll just, um, you know, w- once that comes out, it'll be great to have a chat with you, and uh, and also want to talk about Antarctica. I know you had uh, that on your Twitter as well. Love that sure. subject as well. Awesome, man. Yeah, definitely. So that's a, probably a good little teaser for our next conversation here in the next few months, probably. All right, hey, sounds good. Cheers, Ryan. Hoo-hoo, well then, that was quite the conversation, I'd say. Really makes me want to never touch my penis again. But my thanks, again, to Greg, a.k.a. Blood Ritual Monarch. If you want to read his full demonic and sexual exploits, his books are linked in the show notes. Also, another thank you to Andrew Austin for hanging out during the intro. Andrew and I actually chatted for several more minutes, and he has a unique approach to his trade, which combines psychotherapy and magic. And based on what he was telling me about it, we went ahead and booked an interview, so you'll hear much more from him in the next few months on that topic. Fascinating stuff, for real. But as far as this conversation with BRM is concerned, I've had quite a few people reach out to me to talk about mind control. Of all the things I've covered so far, it's the one topic that people seem to be the most responsive to. I don't know what that says, but I will say that prior to recording these episodes about it, I was not that interested in mind control. And that may be because, from my own personal experiences, I know already that the mind can be controlled, or at the very least manipulated. I took psychology courses in college as electives because i always been fascinated with the human brain and the psyche and how it works. I used to read neuroscientific studies like some people read the Bible. In fact, I read the DSM a couple of times, which is the Bible if you're into psychology. That's a pretty fucked up book these days, by the way, but that's a whole other conversation. Of course, I may not be interested in mind control as much because it could just be another dirty elitist trick to get people to give up their power. Because if you think you're not in control of your own thoughts and behaviors, you're not gonna be. Honestly, it could be a trick to distract you from the things that really do control your mind. And I'm talking about all the poison that we consume in our food and water and air. That shit, that shit will rearrange your neurochemicals for sure. So do I think frequencies from cell phones and radio waves and the television can fuck with your mind? Absolutely. That's some dangerous and unhealthy shit. But I'll tell you what, so is fast food and sugar, and alcohol, and pesticides, and liquid soaps, and aerosol sprays. That shit will control your mind just as much. You know why? Because consuming that sort of stuff only makes you want to consume more of it. No more potent mind control trick than the one you willingly choose to play on yourself. And also, I think it goes without saying that if your mind ain't right, don't go fucking with the Goetia. Hey, if you like what you heard, please do consider supporting the show by visiting oculturepodcast.com slash support. Couple different options that you can support the show monetarily. Monthly options through PayPal, one-time donations through PayPal, 
and one-time donations via Bitcoin. If you can't spare any loose change, that's cool. Maybe drop the show a good rating on iTunes. That helps us out tremendously. We actually got a couple more recently. We're up to 15 total reviews, all five stars. And those of you who've left a review, thank you so much. I love you. Those of you who monetarily support the show right now, I love you. Your time and support and effort to do these things to help me out is appreciated. And I am forever in your debt. But anyway, that wraps up another one here. Thanks for hanging out. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Please rewind this cassette.